the name has changed, but the conversations remain the same. It's now a woman's perspective. The Daughters of Sheba Foundation will continue its tradition. Nothing will take us off track from the woman's perspective. Join us each month. that picture what do you see you see a woman smiling with a little boy smiling you know when we see pictures like this you see these smiles it's a snapshot it's a moment everything looks great right that's me and my son Brian I see that smile there but I also know things about what was happening at that time that you don't know I know that I was doing the best I could as a mom. I worked really hard. And I also reflect now when I look at that picture, about 10 years from that time, Brian would develop an addiction. And it got really hard and scary. And I had to learn how to live my life knowing that he might die from his addiction. Hello, my name is Karen, and I'm a mom. Mom, that word elicits many emotions from people. You may have felt something, thought something when you heard me say that. In my role, I'm a mental health counselor. I hear lots of people talk about their experiences as a mom and with their moms. I am a mom and I have a mom. So there's lots of things that can come up around the word and that role. There are really high expectations for moms in the outcomes with their children's, in, with her children. But when Brian was going through his addiction, what I found was that those expectations and the responsibility was even more intense for the outcomes for our children. So there are three. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Claudette Hesterin Campbell and I am the president and chairperson of the Daughters of Sheba Foundation. How are you this evening? Sorry, I'm sounding a little low. First of all, let me check if my volume is okay. Actually here, let me, yeah, okay. So you are hearing me. <laughs> I'm sounding a little low because it has been uh, quite an emotional day for me. Um, I, I, we, you know, th there's a saying, be careful what you wish for. And um, we at the Daughters of Sheba Foundation, as some of you might know, it's a Canadian registered nonprofit organization. We, in August of this year, we'll be celebrating our fourth year in existence. Prior to that, though, the Daughters of Sheba Foundation existed as a private Facebook group. We still have a Facebook group where um, we we have over close to 400 members. However, um, in the last little bit, for the last three years, we um, have been just doing our thing, doing our thing. And then um, 
earlier this year, I said to to the other directors and you know the team in general that you know I want to to expand our focus. I want to widen our lens and um, not be so, hold on, let me remove this, not be so focused on, because we were primarily focused on Jamaica to the extent that um, we would tend to come on and from time to time, a guest or two will speak in Jamaican Patois and uh, some people didn't understand that. And that was never my intention for, for this organization to be so myopic. I am a Jamaican by birth, but I am a Canadian citizen for the past 22 years. So anyhow, in the last, um, so for three and a half years, we have been operating with um, an audience of about three, three and a half thousand. In the last two months, I don't know what happened. And we, we, we didn't buy any likes or anything like that we don't do that we tried that once and um didn't like it didn't like the experience but you know you have to try didn't like the experience but in the last three months or two months something happened and we have seen an exponential growth increase in our reach uh, maybe facebook changed the algorithm maybe something that we have started posting something well, anyhow two days ago I posted that um, we now had 24,000 followers, 24K followers. Just before I came on, we are now at 27K followers. And I am, I am astounded at the way it's, it's, we're just expanding our reach. But with that comes responsibility. And no one is more aware of that than I am. We have a responsibility to stay true to our mandate and to to and all of those things that comes with that. And part of that, um, our focus is always on women, always on women. And we have, I've noticed that a lot of men have come onto our platform and trying to to tell us what to say, what to do, and how to be women, and not into that, not playing that game with nobody. So let's just get that clear. Um, anyhow, we I posted something a few days now. I've been posting some stuff about um, mothers and fathers and their children and so forth. And today it hit a nerve whereby I've had so many people inboxing us and posting on our page about their experience with their mother passing. And... Um, either not being there to get the last phone call or whatever. And that just kind of hit a nerve with me too, in that it has had me quite in an emotional state. I'm not a weepy person. I am what they call a strong black woman, but um, that that hit me away today in that it's, it's, it, it, touched, it touched a nerve in me. So I'm a little emotional. And then I watched that clip that that we just we were all just watching about a mother dealing with her child because I'm prepared. I was preparing for conversation with Debbie, and I know that Debbie's going to make me cry. So my Kleenex is ready. Um, I've read excerpts of her book and 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 so forth. So anyway, that's so I'm apologizing if I'm a little low. So thank God I have company, and let me bring in two of our directors, Clara Brown and Gloria Rose Saunders. Clara is our director secretary and Gloria is our treasurer. And both these ladies are with me tonight and they're always here once every month on this particular program, which we call A Woman's Perspective, where we discuss topics having to do with women, women's issues from one woman's perspective, sometimes, sometimes from many women's perspective. Tonight we're talking about mothering a child um, with mental health issues, and it can go beyond mothering. It can be sistering someone with mental health issues, basically walking with someone with serious mental health issues, and that's our focus tonight. So um, before we bring in our guests, I don't know, Clara and Gloria got, like I did, excerpts of Debbie's book, and we all had a chance to go through, and um, I don't know if, um, no, you didn't? <laughs> I know you did, Clara. You told me you did, or were you lying? Unmute yourself, Clara. Unmute yourself. <laughs> 
Just a line. Um, just a line. <laughs> just a line. <laughs> okay, okay. Gloria, did you have a chance to read the excerpt? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Well, and um, so you are you are emotionally ready for this conversation. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's emotionally ready for this conversation. I just want to say good evening to Colleen and good evening to, to Carella. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so I don't want to waste our time any further. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for being ever faithful, ever sure. And um, I just want to read a, a, a quick excerpt from Debbie's book. And then uh, we will bring her in and go into, go into our conversation with her. So, and the, the, the book is, I, I, think, I, I think I'll ask her when she comes up, if it, when she comes on, if it's okay for me to, to share the link to the excerpt. But chapter one starts, my life changed forever. It was the thurs first Thursday in January 2022, and my home had been without power and heat since the big snowstorm Monday. Like the last several nights, I barely slept as my body fought to keep warm. I dozed off for a bit before the morning. A little before 9 a.m., my cell phone rang. I was awake but lay in bed under a pile of blankets. The number was a Virginia number, but not a familiar one. I answered. Is this Debbie Gale Zane? Is your son Alex? A man's voice said. Yes, I responded to both questions. This is Officer Ken with the Fairfax County Police Department. I'm so sorry to do this over the phone, but I looked up your address and you live over an hour away and with the snow and all, your son, Alex, was found dead in his hotel room this morning. It felt like my entire body stopped. My heart, my brain, my breathing, my thoughts, my ability to move. After a few moments, I somehow managed to speak. No! No! I kept saying. I ran downstairs to get Mark to sit with me while I continued to listen to the officer. Okay, that's as far as I can go. Hello, Debbie, how are you? Hi, thank you for having me on. And thank you for reading the excerpt. You did a beautiful job reading it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, 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 I don't know that that's a compliment I want this evening because as a mother and a grandmother myself, and my my two um, co-hosts are mothers themselves, that's a phone call that none of us want. And um, I usually I go into a different kind of opening, but this evening we're just gonna get straight to the point. Um, I, this is not the kind of conversation that we can do icebreakers and all of that with. This is, this is real mother stuff. So Debbie, thank you again for being here. For those of you who, who don't know Debbie, have never met Debbie, didn't see it on our website or anything, Debbie um, is a transformational life coach, a grief coach, relationship and parent coach, author of the book, the excerpt from which I just read, Finding Peace and Purpose Amidst the Tears, My Journey of the Love and Loss of My Son Through His Mental Illness and Addiction. She's also the host of the internet talk show and podcast, Finding Peace Beyond the Pain on the Bold Brave TV network. She was featured on Fox 5, WTTG, DC TV, and many others, Washington DC TV, and has been a host on many podcasts and was recognized by one of the world's biggest influencers, Tony Robbins, for her journey of turning her pain into purpose by helping parents in the aftermath of losing her 26-year-old son following his nine-year battle with schizoaffective schizo disorder and addiction. Debbie, what a journey you've been on. And, really an hour, and an hour is not enough, um, but let us start. Tell us about Alex. Tell us about 
when you found out you were pregnant and how did that feel? Is it, was he your only child? It was he you were your first pregnancy? Tell us all about little Alex. Oh, I love that question. Um, he, I, he's my oldest of three. So that was my first pregnancy. And as a mom, that was like one of the most exciting moments, right? When you find out you're pregnant and you're going to have your first child and I mean, I'll never forget, you know, I'll never forget the day he was born and just, you know, he was just such a, such a beautiful, wonderful child, wonderful baby. Um, he, as a, as you know, a really young child, he got into sports, even at age three or four, he was kicking the ball around the yard and it later became into a passion of his and he, he played soccer and travel soccer and you know, I, I loved going to his games, taking him to his games. And, but as a child, he was just, he was, um, he was very easy. There was nothing really to lead me to believe that as he got older, there was going to be, you know, the issues that we dealt with. He had really such a normal childhood. He was always um, interested in religion and, and he kept with that. He, that's, that's something he kept throughout his childhood, young adulthood, teenage years, everything. And he was a great big brother to his uh, younger brother and younger sister. They were all 20 months apart. So he was my oldest and it was 20 months. And then my other son was born 20 months. And then my daughter was born. And they were all, because most of the years of raising them, I was a single mom. They were all extremely close. They were all just almost like best friends. In fact, um, maybe, I don't know, for many, many years in their teens and 20s, there was probably almost never a time that went by when my two sons wouldn't be in communication with each other. Even when my younger son went off to college a few hours away and later graduated and got a job, they were always, they never, never a day went by that they were not in communication. They were just, they were just really close. And the other thing I want to add about Alex is he loved family. So he mm -hmm. was that teenager that he was actually willing to not, not go out with his friends if we were going to have like relatives come over and we were going to have like a family gathering or something. He just, he would get so excited about family. And once he was in his twenties, and every time we would all get together, he would just get so excited. He, he just lived for family. So then when, sorry guys, jump in whenever you want to, but I just had this follow-up question. When did you notice things started to change? Yeah, so when he was 17 years old, which was his senior year in high school, near the beginning of senior year, he came to me one night and it was a holiday weekend. And I, I remember sitting in my bed and he came in and he said, mom, I need to talk to you about something. And I kind of could tell by his voice that this was something pretty serious and heavy. And he told me that he had been thinking about killing himself. And he described exactly how he had planned to do it. And he even admitted that he had tried before and as a mom, that was so hard for me to hear. Like inside I was screaming, but I knew that he trusted me to come to me to, to share this. And so I just tried to remain calm and listen so that he could get out what he wanted to share and so that I could be supportive of him and we could figure out what to do. And that was the beginning of our journey with mental illness for him. It led to a three and a half week hospitalization at a psychiatric hospital for uh, adolescents. And it was there that he was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Can you explain to us what's um, schizoaffective in layman's term? Absolutely. So um, it's a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar in that it has 
um, the mood disorder components of bipolar in that he could have swings between severe depression and suicidal thoughts. And it could also go the other way into manic episodes. And so you could basically have those back and forth shifts between highs and lows. And then it had some of the components of schizophrenia. So he had a lot of paranoia. He had hallucinations, both auditory and visual hallucinations. Guys, any questions from you? No. <laughs> so, so Debbie, hi, Carol. Hi. Um, you said that um, Alex came to you at age 17. Was he still in high school? Was he still very active in his sports or soccer, as, as which was his passion? Was was he still was he still in high school? Did he or did he graduate high school? Um, he was still in high school. It was the it was the end of November of his senior year. So he had already kind of had he did play sports at the beginning of the year. The year started the senior year started probably mid August, mm -hmm. and so he was doing soccer and he was doing cross country running, and those had ended. So it was kind of like a break. Uh, in the US, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving. I think you guys have a holiday, but in a different month. We have it in there. Yeah, we have it in Canada, we have it in October. <laughs> yeah, we have it at the end of November. So uh, the sports had finished for the, you know, for the fall season. And so we were just kind of in between and it was over the Thanksgiving holiday when he came to me. And was he at home for high school or he went away for high school? He was at home. He was living at home. So for all, all intents and purposes, this was a, I hate to use this word, so please excuse me. This was a normal teenager doing teenager stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was no indication prior to him coming to say to you, mom, we need to talk. No, no, there wasn't. And I've, you know, I've talked to my other two kids at various times, you know, even fairly recently, just to, you know, ask them, did you guys ever see this coming? Did you? And they didn't. And so it's just, I don't really know what happened. And it was when we were on the way to the hospital that he started talking about some of his other symptoms as far as like his paranoia. I remember he said that he was afraid that people were spying on him and that he had to block off his windows and his bedroom. And at the hospital, he was afraid they took his shoes and they, they gave him these slippers for the hospital because they don't want the shoelaces. Nothing with laces or ties at the, at the hospital. So he was afraid to put on the slippers because he said that there might be something in there spying on him. So I had no idea the extent of everything that that started to come out over the next weeks and months. Gloria? That must have been quite a shock. It really was a huge shock. Um, I mean, my life was turned upside down and it, it, I mean, our lives did change. I mean, of course our lives changed forever when I right. lost him, but the first time they were forever changed was when he first came to me that he was suicidal because everything was different from then on. So you said you were a single mom. Yeah. At, at this point, what, what was the relationship with the dad? Was he, um, is he alive? Was he alive? Was yeah, his, their dad is alive. He lived in a different state and um, he had other children. And so he didn't spend a whole lot of time with my children. He saw them occasionally. So that was, sometimes they would fly to where he lived and see him. Um, as Alex got older, Alex mo most of the time didn't go. Do you think that played a factor in his change in behavior? 
not having his dad um, or a father figure around. I'm assuming there was no other father figure. No, there wasn't. Um, I mean, we had been divorced since Alex was seven. So it had been quite a long time. Um, you know, it's just, it's hard to say why somebody develops mental illness. It's just so hard to, it's just so hard to know, you know, what happened and, and why, and why is, why is his thinking so different? And, you know, I had three children and, you know, they're all just, they're all so different. You know, the others didn't have this, the same sort of illness. I want to come back to your, your other two kids in, in a little bit, but so he stayed in the hospital for three weeks, was diagnosed, and then what happened after the three weeks? Yeah, so then, then he was discharged to be able to come home, and they did have, the hospital had an outpatient program, so every day I would take him to the outpatient program, and he would attend that. And I found um, a psychiatrist for him because before that we didn't have a psychiatrist. We didn't have a therapist. You know, the hospital social worker helped me. She gave me lists of doctors to call. And um, that was a whole big thing here because, um, you know, we have in the U.S. we have insurance and not everybody takes insurance or is in the plan. And I ended up having to find doctors not in the insurance because those I was looking for doctors who had worked with somebody with schizoaffective disorder because I remember thinking that I am going to get him the best help that is out there so that he can live you know the most normal life that he possibly can and you know we're going to get this under control and he's going to feel better and and so I had these really high hopes that if I you know got these wonderful people in place that could um, help and support him in this, that he would get better. And the hospital did tell me that it is a difficult process. They said that there are medications that can help, but many medications have side effects and they can make things worse. And it can be a really long process to even find the right ones. And then they said, even if you do find the right ones, Many times they don't like the side effects and they go off their medications and yeah. then you have problems. And so, you know, I just, I heard these things, but I was still determined that I was going to find him the right people. So I made lots of calls to, to doctors, to therapists, kind of interviewed them, you know, if they would allow me to come in and meet with them in person, I did that and asked a lot of questions and found what I believed was some great doctors and therapists to support him so he was in therapy for how long prior to you know his exit right up to that point no because he didn't go consistently um okay. yeah he he so he i think he i also shared with you so he also became addicted to drugs and alcohol and so he was in and out of treatment centers he was in and out of psychiatric hospitals because he had different times when he became suicidal and so he went back into the hospital there were different times where he went into treatment for drugs or alcohol so he had different doctors and different counselors along the way he didn't stay with that same ones that i found him so in the later years, in his 20s, I know before he passed away, he had been in and out of a rehab center for drugs and alcohol, and it was a dual diagnosis, so they also dealt with mental illness. And it was over the pandemic, so when he got out of the treatment center, he had his, um, uh, I guess it's like an outpatient type of a program, but it was all virtual due to the pandemic. So he had this counselor that he loved. I remember her name was Vicky because I notified her when Alex passed away and he really liked her a lot. And they did some parent meetings. So I was able to be on virtually and be on a parent meeting. He did group programs through that program. So basically once he started going, uh, putting himself in and out of treatment in his adulthood, he would usually do some kind of outpatient program associated with that and have counselors and therapists through that program. And so he wasn't still with the same doctors I found for him in his teenage years. 
So just, just to answer a question by um, a viewer, Twin Figueroa, uh, he's asked, or I think it's a he, is asking what we're talking about tonight. And our conversation tonight is about mothering a child with mental health issues. And our guest is is uh, the lady who was just speaking, is Debbie Gail Zane. And Debbie is is mother of a, three children, one of them who unfortunately um, is no longer with us due to his challenges with, I can't pronounce it, schizoaffective disorder and addiction. Did I pronounce that properly? Yeah, <laughs> and, disorder. Right. So that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. And um, a painful discussion, you know, um, Debbie has a book called Feeding, Finding Peace and Purpose Amidst the Tears, My Journey of Love and the Loss of My Son Through His Mental Illness and Addiction. So let me ask you, when did the addiction become an issue? When did you find out that he was using drugs and, and, and how did that part of things go? Well, when he was in the hospital, it came out during that three and a half weeks he was there when we had some family meetings that he had started using marijuana. And at that time, I was really concerned because that was felt like such a big deal to me. But I would say over the next year, the marijuana turned to more and more things. And it became probably another year after that where it really became a lot of hard drugs and at some point when he was 19 years old, he had a heroin addiction and he went into treatment for that and he got put on some kind of a medication that would help him to not have cravings for the heroin and, and it would deal with the, um, I guess the, maybe the detox symptoms of, of when he stopped the heroin, but he later went on to other drugs. And I think that it was at some point of his life, almost every drug out there he probably had tried. So do you ladies have anything to ask on that? Yes, I do. Go ahead, go ahead, Gloria. Do you think that um, him being um, an addict, whether it be drug or alcohol, was his way of trying to cope with the illness? I really do, yeah. I think, I think life was really difficult for him. And he suffered a lot, and he did he did go on and off of his medications and I don't know that he purposely did it, but sometimes he would run out and the side effects really bothered him and he didn't really feel like himself. And I feel like the drugs were a way for him to just kind of not have to cope with all of this, not have to deal with such, such a difficult way to live. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to ask on that before we move on to something else, maybe Clara has somewhere else to go with this. Um, you found out about the marijuana use, as you said, during one of those sessions. But when he told you that he needed to talk with you, you know, and, and told you what he was feeling, looking back, was he already using marijuana? I think that I think that that's what the hospital was saying when we had one of the family meetings and they said he had used marijuana. I think that's what they were saying is that he had already started using marijuana before that night that he came to me and he was suicidal. So was there any suggestion I'm asking that the marijuana was like cuz I've I've in the past in my past experience they they it said that marijuana is like a gateway drug. Um was 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 that the case here and who introduced him to marijuana i think it was i would i called these people his drug friends so they weren't the friends that he grew up with and played sports with but he had other friends i guess that he met in high school and as the years went on i called these people drug friends because they were people he did drugs with and um, but I did hear the same thing as what you said about marijuana being a gateway drug, which is why it worried me when I found out that he had been using marijuana because I was worried about the future and him, you know, well, first I didn't like him using the marijuana, but I also was worried about it getting worse. Okay. And the worst fears came through. Yes, exactly. I do believe it's a gateway drug because I think sometimes once you're using it and maybe the people you're using it with and then they're using more stuff and then, you know, before you know it, he's, he's using more as well. 
Okay, so um, fast forward to, you know, he's 19, he's 20. Is he still living with you? What, what's happening in his life? Is he working? Is he still in college? What, what's going on up to the point when you got that telephone call? The yeah, so he was living with me for a few years, and then he, there was one year where he was in and out of rehab for drugs and alcohol three different times, and the third time, his counselor said to me that he thought that it would be best for Alex to go into what they call, it was like a sober living home. So here in our state, it was called an Oxford house, and basically they had men's homes and women's homes, and so he went into one where it was just all men and they kind of support each other. They're required to go to um, Alcohol Anonymous or, or Narcotics Anonymous meetings. They're required to get a job. And so somebody in there helped him to get a job. So he was working um, at a grocery store. He actually kept that job for five years, which is pretty mm -hmm. amazing for him. Um, and so that was the beginning of him living outside of the home. And there was a period where he came back home for about six months, but it, it was, it was a disaster. He was, he relapsed again. He was using drugs. Things were really getting out of hand. And it was suggested to me again to like, you know, find some sort of living. I wanted him to go back into um, one of those sober living homes and he did go back but then it ended up he from then on he he didn't like living there so he basically just was like renting a room um, so I helped him financially throughout the process even when he was in the sober living home and then later when he was renting a room so he he moved around a lot he was basically renting a room. So he wasn't living with me when I got that call that he had passed away. You ladies, any questions? Um, for me, I, I think, um, you know, as, as being a mom as well and um, having a son, because I, I know boys are different from girls. Um, we tend to, to, to be very close to our boys. We tend to want to to, to cuddle them more a bit, but I know for myself, when anything goes awry with my boy, I feel myself, I, I think like, what could I have done differently? Um, you know, I sort of figure, you know, did I do something wrong or, you know, where did things go wrong? And I, and I feel as if sometimes as parents, we, we share a lot of a, the guilt and burden when our children, when things happen to our kids. Did you feel that way? Yeah, definitely. I would say for at least the first few years, I really had the toughest time where I took a lot of it personally and I felt guilty and I felt responsible and I felt like I needed to somehow fix it, even though I tried and I couldn't fix it. I tried to do everything I can. And it was, it was really difficult until I kind of realized that I was living in this space where I had, you know, I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't, um, you know, I was worried a lot. I was living in fear a lot. I was living in guilt a lot. And I, once I realized this, I was able to make changes for myself and I was able to really take better care of myself and release some of the guilt and, and, you know, be more kind and gentle with myself and be able to really not be stuck in the what ifs and, and fears and everything and be able to show up in a better way for Alex and for my other two children. So there was kind of like a turning point for me. Which was my, my, my question. My other question was, <laughs> How did you cope balancing being a mother, being a person who three children are depending on you solely and you are also required to depend on you? How how did you find how did you balance? What's what did you draw on what did you 
was it a community? Was it your relatives or friends? How did you cope? So I did, I did have support. I was in a support group called Al-Anon. I also had some support through the NAMI program, which is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And, and just to reiterate, Al-Anon is a support group for um, loved ones of somebody who has um, alcohol or drug addiction. And so I did have support groups and my closest friends, I actually met in Al-Anon. And so I had that support and I think ba the balance is I had to learn to be able to, like I said, take care of myself because I learned if I didn't take care of myself, I wasn't in the best place to deal with the many crises that happened. So there were a number of times that that I almost lost Alex throughout the years to drug overdoses. There were times where he overdosed and we didn't think he was going to make it. And so, you know, there were a number of crises. And, you know, like you said, I had two other children. Alex was my oldest. And so I did learn that I had to carve out time for me. That that very first time that he was in the hospital for three and a half weeks, I didn't, I took zero time for me. I did not, um, I did not do anything for myself and it was really difficult. But in the later years, I learned that even if it's just a very brief period of time, I had to really, t I had to take care of myself. I had to do that in order to show up in a better way for my children. So um, I, I I don't want to, to, to stay too long on the actual day of his passing and funeral and all of that because I don't want to cause you any pain. Uh, I, I don't know where you are in your healing process. Um, feel free to tell us what you want about that period. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer um, questions. It's been about two and a half years. Um, so any questions that you have, um, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Guys, you have any questions on that? I mean, I, I, I personally have gone through um, passing, traumatic passing of a husband. So too has Gloria. And um, I know that for Gloria more than me, and I'm speaking for her, um, you know, there are some triggers there. So I didn't want to, to, to um, delve okay. too much in that. Okay. So you got the call from the cops and who did you, 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 you I read the excerpt said you went to Mark, you called Mark to come and sit with you. Who who walked with you through that? Who who I'm sorry, he did you walked, say walked with you? W A L K E D. Yeah. So um at the time I was living with my boyfriend okay. and he was the one that I went to go get. And I I think I also added my parents to the line. I think I asked the officer, can I add my parents to the call? And I'm so glad I did because they absorbed what I didn't absorb. I really did not absorb much from that call. And at the time, I also, my children and I had all gotten together. They had all come to visit me where I was living with my boyfriend. Um, they had all come on New Year's Day. So this happened on um, January 5th. And so January 1st, we, they had all come over, they came over and we had like a really nice time. And after that, I ended up getting sick with um, COVID. And I, so my parents actually went to the funeral home and made arrangements and put me on the phone. And I was really grateful that they were able to kind of step in and do this because I remember there were so many decisions like on the phone, they were like, okay, you have to choose this and choose this. And I remember thinking like these, what might be like a smaller decision, everything felt an enormous. Like my brain just could not, you know, it was really hard to focus on these decisions that I had to make. Everything felt really big. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's been two and a half years, you said, since um, Alex is passing. How are you doing now? Yeah, so I you, still... not 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 the author, not the coach, you, Debbie. Yeah. How are you doing now? Yeah, I still I still miss him so much. I mean, I'm never going to stop missing him. I think 
I think that what has helped me a lot is I have really stayed connected with him. I can feel his love and I, I talk out loud to him every single day. I ask him to be with me. I do a lot of, um, a lot of work to help, to help others who are on a similar journey. And whenever I'm doing something, if I'm getting ready to do a show or I'm getting ready to do a book signing, I ask, Alex is with me. I ask him, I'm like, Alex, please, you know, please help me through this. Please bring anybody to this that needs to hear the story that, or that needs my book. I mean, he's with me in everything I do. So I think what helps me is that I have this relationship with him, but it's not a physical relationship. So I still, it's still hard because there are days where I just really wish that I could just give him a physical hug. And, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, and I, I seek grief support from myself as well, even though I help others and I, you know, it helps me to help others. It helps me, it helped me to write that book too. And, but I also have grief support for myself. So I am in a virtual grief group. Okay. And how are your other two kids coping? What are their ages? Um, so my son is, He's now 27, so he's now older than Alex was when Alex passed. Alex was 26 when he passed. So my other son is 27, and my daughter is 25 and a half. Okay. How are they coping? How, how are they doing? How has life been for them since Alex has passed in? Yeah, so my son... He had gotten engaged shortly before Alex passed away and Alex was going to be the best man in their wedding. They hadn't planned the wedding yet, but um, you know, they knew about the engagement. And so after Alex passed away, um, you know, he kind of put his planning of the wedding on hold. He didn't, you know, want to make any, he didn't want to have any other dates in 2022. And so, um, that was hard because, you know, he wanted his brother to be at the wedding. And so it was just last year that they scheduled their wedding. And so he's going to get married in October. And mm -hmm. I think I know he talks to Alex out loud as well. And we've all kind of um, worked with a medium as well. And so I think that helped him some things that were kind of relayed that um, that the medium shared that he knew that nobody else could have known. And so I think he feels, he's gonna feel Alex's presence. I think it's gonna be hard for all of us. If, you know, it's gonna be bittersweet. Of course, I'm so happy for, for him to get married. Um, but we are going to miss Alex, of course. And with um, but I think I think it's hard for him. He was very close with his brother. I think I told you they were best friends. And so he he definitely is. It's it's still difficult for him. And, and your daughter. Yeah. And my daughter, she still misses him a lot, too. It's it's hard for her as well. And she she's helped me in a number of things that I do. She's she's come on my show before and shared her story from a sibling perspective of, um, you know, having a sibling with with mental health issues and addiction. And so she likes to get involved with helping other people as well. But it's you know, it's hard. We miss, you know, holidays are really hard because, you know, I would say holidays his birthday, our birthdays, um, for me, Mother's Day, you know, the, the anniversary of his death, like those are all dates that are, that are difficult for my two children and I. Yeah. So before we wrap up here, I just want to talk to you about what you have done with the pain. So I, I, I understand that you inspire others, you know, facing similar 
um, pain as yourself, uh, grief of having a child with mental illness and or addiction and who have lost a child or another loved one. Um, it says that you walk with people on their journey and that you have developed a unique process called Peace Beyond the Pain. And it provides holistic tools and strategies for navigating grief, loss, pain, hopelessness, overwhelmment, fear, and guilt. Tell us a little more about that, this process. Yeah, so absolutely. So um, I, I help parents that either have a child with mental illness and addiction or who have lost a child because I, I want them to, you know, I want to support them by somebody who has been through it myself as a parent. And I've also received a lot of extensive training as a coach and also as a, um, a certified grief educator. And so I, um, I, work, I work with the parents, I meet them where they are, wherever they are in this process. And um, if they've lost a child, you know, we kind of, we walk through that grief process and it's important to kind of, for them to understand what they're feeling and, and what, what stages they're in and to just have that pain um, acknowledged and to have their feelings acknowledged and to be seen and to be heard. And there's also parallel to that. If you have a child with mental illness and addiction, there's also grief that's involved because those parents are grieving the loss of how their child was prior to mental illness and addiction and how life looked prior to mental illness and addiction and maybe the hopes and dreams that they had for their child and the hopes and dreams that their child had for themselves. And so I walk them through the grief process because sometimes they're not even aware that there is a process of grieving. Um, and, and also when they have a child with mental illness and addiction, many times the, um, something that gives them a lot of pain is they are so focused on things that they have no control over. And so we kind of work on, you know, what we actually have control over and what we don't. And there are things that we can do. And so it can be more empowering and to bring more peace when we focus on the things that we can do as opposed to the things that we can't do. Um, another thing that I work with them on is releasing the guilt. This guilt came up earlier. And, and so many times in both scenarios, the parents have guilt. When, when they have a child with mental illness and addiction, you know, like we were talking about earlier, is we blame ourselves. As parents, we feel like it's our job to, to fix everything. It's our job to take the pain from our child. And we feel like every, we feel we have the sense of over responsibility and so helping them to release that guilt and also when we're a parent that's lost a child many times we also suffer from guilt like is there something that we could have done could we have you know done something different said something different um you know what if life was different and you know we can take on this guilt we can create we can create stories you know and it's kind of also realizing what is actually a story and what is actually true. And, um, and so these are some of the things that we work on. And, and the goal is to, if we have, if they've lost a child, you know, to be able to actually, the only way through our emotions is to be able to feel them. So to be able to go through this, process and to be able to remember our child with more love than pain. How do you do that? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, it just came. How do you, how do you put aside the pain? How do I put the side? How do I put this? How, 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 let's say it's me and you're coaching me. What are some of the strategies you would you would give to me to to help me to to remember them with more love than pain, as you said? So it is so it is a process, and and part of that process is to actually so when we're in grief, we have these needs, and so so it's it's being able like we have the need to have our pain to be witnessed, and so. 
it's going through this process and, and meeting these different needs. And so witnessing our pain, allowing them to be heard. And many times the person needs to be able to, you know, talk about their child and talk through some of the things. And there's other people in their life who may not be able to continue to listen to these things because, you know, they don't understand, they haven't lost a child, they haven't gone through this process. And so they have a need to be heard, to have their pain witnessed, um, to be able to, we, we work on to be able to work through these emotions and get to a place where we are able to find some meaning. And sometimes it can just be something that is a small, small amount of meaning, like, um, you know, something that our child loved to do. And, and so we continue that tradition, maybe. Say they love to go to this specific restaurant, so we continue this tradition, or they love to make this specific food, we continue it. Just any type of things to find meaning, just starting small and picking out little things that can bring meaning to um, the love we had for the child and to be able to um, find more and more ways to integrate the love that we had for our child into our life. And so learning how to integrate the, the, pain, the pain and the love and, and, and integrate all of that into our lives. And I, I know it sounds kind of difficult, but it's sort of a process of meeting the person where they are and mm -hmm. kind of, it's a process of going through and allowing their grief to be witnessed, allowing them to be heard, helping them to find meaning, helping them to integrate the love. And it is a process. Clara, you have any final questions? Um, no, not not anymore. Oh, well, the question I had has been has been answered in in answering other said. questions. So. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know where Gloria went. Um, so, as we wrap up here, speak to the mother who, um, like you, for. Um, 17 years, 16 years, didn't know, well, I'm sure it didn't start when he was a baby, but, you know, for however many years, didn't realize, recognize, see mm -hmm. until that the child come to you that he was in trouble, that he had entered a, a phase that was going to be seriously problematic. Mm -hmm. Um speak to that mother who is now watching us or we have lots of people who watch our videos after the fact um who has a 16 year old girl or boy at home right now who is locked up in their room doing all of those things that alex said you know and being scared of all of those things that alex was scared of speak to that mother how does she recognize the signs and what does she do about those signs before it gets to hospitalization? I think one of the biggest things to do is keeping the lines of communication open. I think it's so important to really be aware of what's going on with your child and to, um, to spend time with them, to be that safe, non-judgmental space so that they feel comfortable coming to you with whatever's bothering them. They have to be able to feel safe and that like, and that they can be heard. And I mean, I was really blessed that we had such a close relationship. So he trusted me to come to me and share this with me. So the best thing that you can do is really to just be that soft space for them to just give that unconditional love. And, you know, you're, you know, if they're a teenager, of course, you're not always going to agree on everything. You're going to have conflicts and everything, but you want to just really show that unconditional love and just be this loving support for them and you know sometimes we may not even realize that we're being judgmental but sometimes you know we can be with with our our body language sometimes with our words and so it's just really important to be able to listen and without judgment and when i say listen is sometimes our child comes to us 
and they have something to say. And as parents, we're really quick to step in and tell and give them advice and tell them what they need to do or that kind of thing. But we have to remember that they came to us for a reason to share something. And so just really having those listening skills. And I think that this can go a long way to keeping that communication open because you can't you can't force your child to tell you something that they don't want to to share with you. And so um, I feel like forcing doesn't really work. Um, uh, Glory, do you have any final questions? Uh, no, no. Okay. So I, I hear you. My question is follow up to that is this happened with you and Alex. Um, this started what 10 years ago, five years ago, oh, um, just before COVID, right? With, with, with what when he came to you? When he oh, came no, to this you. was when he was 17 and he 17. died when he was 26. So, this right, was so 10 years, a 10 year process, roughly. Oh, yeah, this was a long process. Yeah, okay. from age so, 26. Yeah. So, fast forward to now, 10 years later, or 10 plus years later, where children don't really talk to parents anymore. They they go to the Google or to, to TikTok, like I do, <laughs> to get information. Talk to that parent who they see, they might see something, but the child is not saying anything to them. The child is on TikTok. Yeah. So I know that I know we're so into social media now and that's what our children are doing. But I still think it's really important to try to get involved in their lives. And you're definitely not going to do this by trying to just talk about the problems or the difficulties or the issues. I think try to connect with them on things that they enjoy, you know, try to find an interest that they have or something that the two of you have in common, learn about them, ask them questions about things that they enjoy. Like, for example, my son was so into studying genetics for fun on his own online. And so I would talk about this with him. He was into religion. I would talk about this with him, you know, get involved in the things that they enjoy, the things that they love. And so, you know, when you're passionate about something, it's easier for you to talk about it. But if you're, you know, a teenager and, you know, you are thinking about doing drugs or you're using drugs, like you're not going to respond so well if they're, if your parent is asking you about that, but try to connect with them um, on other levels so that, so that you have that closer connection. Parenting is so hard now. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm a grandmother, but even talking to my 10 year old granddaughter is like pulling teeth sometimes. <laughs> and, um, so I, I, I anyway, uh, Debbie, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you have any last final words that you would like to leave with our audience? Yeah, this is one thing that I that I really feel that um, life is precious and we never know how long we or somebody else has. And so really making the most of the time that you do have with your loved ones. And, you know, if it's not the connection or the relationship that you want, what, you know, what can you do? How can you get closer? How can you give more of your love? How can you show your unconditional love? Folks, this is our very special guest, Debbie Gail Zane. She's an author. She's a author of the book, Finding Peace and Purpose Amidst the Tears, My Journey of Love and Loss of My Son Through Mental Illness and Addiction. She's also an internet talk show and podcast host. And her podcast is called Finding Peace Beyond the Pain on the Bold Brave TV Network. So please check her out. Um, I shared her website. I think, yes, it's, it's scrolling there at the bottom. Debbie's coaching website is uh, debbiegalecoaching.com. Do go check it out and um, follow her. And those of you who um, might, do you provide online coaching, Debbie? Do you consultation, a free consultation to start? Absolutely, I do. So reach out and I'm happy to do a free consultation, no obligation at all. Okay, great. 
great. Well, thank you so much, um, Clara, Gloria. Thank you too for joining us. And those of you who uh, popped in, left a comment, uh, those of you who will be watching this afterwards, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with us. Uh, we don't um, do lives that much. Uh, we do maybe three, four times a month. Uh, thank you, Carella, um, for being with us. I know, I think, doesn't Carella have young people in her life as well? Yeah, son. <laughs> right, a son. <laughs> so, so, so. Adults um, and almost adults. <laughs> well, adults. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, thanks again, Debbie. Um, thank you for being here, and thank you everyone for joining us. Please um, like and follow, and um, thank you the twenty-seven thousand of you who who recently started following us. We greatly appreciate it, and looking forward to more conversations with you as well, Debbie. Have a good evening, everybody, and good night. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Night. Enjoy your trip. Um, Thank you. Debbie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. For having me. Bye-bye.